Welcome to the Everything Everywhere Travel Writer Podcast. Join award-winning freelance journalist Joan Mianmetsui. Each week, you'll hear guests from all walks of life share their travel stories, tips, and advice on a variety of travel-related topics. Thanks for spending time with us today, and now it's time to dive into our interview. Anyone who knows me understands I take fly fishing seriously. I also love fly fishing books and particularly picture books that engage children with heartwarming stories. Today's show is dedicated to outdoors-oriented travel, but my listeners who prefer to observe nature from their hotel room or a car window will want to stick around to hear my guest talk about his travels. My guest today is a longtime publishing professional and an avid fly fisher from Albany, California. He's the winner of the 2018 IFTD AFFTA Award for Best New Entertainment Education Product for his book, Down by the River. Please welcome Andrew Weiner. Hello, Andrew. How are you? Do, you? do you rather be called Andy or Andrew? You know, I prefer to be called Andy, which is funny because the book is published under the name Andrew. And I guess I thought, if you're going to have a book published, you should appear serious <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> so I went with Andrew, but Andy is what most people call me. Let's set a relaxing tone and we'll just say Andy. Okay. All right? When I opened your book... I was in awe of the illustrations. Down by the River is an extraordinary story about fly fishing and a particular trip, and the illustrations are beautiful. When you open the book, the inside cover and the outside cover are all different types of flies that people use in fly fishing. And I think that's just absolutely gorgeous. I love the book, and I wish my kids were young enough that I could lay down at night on the bed next to them and read your book to them. Tell me a little... Oh, it, it is. It's just absolutely gorgeous. Tell but me... I, what I tell people about the illustrations... Yes. Uh, is I, I always can say that I think it's the most beautiful children's fly fishing book ever published, and it's okay to say that because I didn't do the illustrations. They were done by April Chu, who is a, a really talented artist who I met at a party actually here in Berkeley that was a gathering of children's book authors and illustrators. And she had her portfolio with her, and I could see how talented she was. When my book was accepted for publication, I reached out to her to see if she would be interested and was really gratified that she agreed to do it and then that the the editor of the book saw the potential for, for April's art in the book and accepted her as the illustrator. A funny story about the flies that you mentioned at the beginning and the end of the book, um, I felt it was important to have some illustrations of flies, and I went to a fly shop and bought 24 kind of essential <laughs> flies for her to illustrate for the book, and she got so engaged in that process of doing those illustrations that she went out and bought an additional 60 flies or so, oh my and she just found them so fascinating and so beautiful, and now there are approximately 80 unique flies in the end papers. There are no duplications, and I know that from what I've heard from parents who shared the book with their children, it's often the, the absolute favorite part of the book for kids. They just love to go through those illustrations and point out their favorite flies and learn about them, and in some cases, learn how to tie them themselves. Well, you know, the other thing about it that I love is that, I mean, I'm relatively new um, to fly fishing. And when I'm out and out fishing and I there's a fellow fly fisherman next to me, I'll ask, what are you using today? And he'll say, oh, you know, he'll rattle off like a, a particular name. And I'm thinking, you know, the wheels are turning in my head trying to think about what that particular fly looks like. I wish I had your book with me when I'm out fly fishing so that if somebody mentions a a particular one, I can just refer to it and say, oh, okay, you're talking about this particular one. So they are they are just so well done that about, you could use oh, it. I'm sorry. 
that, you know, you, you could really use it when you're out fly fishing. Well, the, the nice thing would be if you were to ask a, a fellow angler what they're using on the water, that they would say, I'm using whatever fly it is, and then reach into their box and slip you in. Right, so, right. Share right. the experience, and quite often that's the case. Yeah, um, that's, that's typically you know, what's happened. You know, that... that, that Sadly, a couple of times I've asked somebody and they've told me what they're using and then they turn away and don't share their fly. Right. And I just feel like, yeah, it would have been nice if you'd given me one or shown me one. And most of the time people are very nice, though. Yeah, they are. Typically the people I run into are very, very nice. What I wanted to know a little bit, um, I've never been to Albany and I was wondering in the event that someone in the audience would like to visit or connect with you. Give us, you know, a, a little bit of a description about Albany and whether you, you know, you grew up there or what you love about it. Well, Albany actually is just a, a town in the San Francisco Bay Area that's just north of Berkeley and just across the San Francisco Bay from San Francisco and then Marin County. In the immediate area, there there isn't access to fly fishing. The closest places are a couple of hours away, which is not a long way to go get some good fishing. I actually moved up to the Bay Area back in 1975 from Southern California. I came up here to go to UC Berkeley and have stayed in the area since then. It's such a great place to live. So with fishing a couple of hours away and then really excellent fishing maybe three to four hours away, it's a great location to get to experience uh, the world of fly fishing, plus just the, the general outdoor recreation that we have here in the Bay Area with you know, beautiful trails and, and the bay and the ocean not too far away. So anybody who comes to the Bay Area, I would invite them to get in touch with me and I can share some insights. I actually was sharing some information with somebody on Instagram just yesterday who lives in Montana and will be coming down to Northern California this summer. Always happy to, happy to share anything that I, I might happen to know or just be able to guess about if I don't know. Well, on that note, one of my questions that I was going to ask you after, you know, at the end of our um, of our episode is... Where can people get in touch with you um, or where can they connect with you if they'd like to know more about your book or if they would like to get together and fly fish? I do have a website for the book, which is www.downbytheriverbook.com, and I can be contacted through that. I'm on Instagram, and my Instagram handle is at Weiner Andy, so that's W E I N E R A N D Y, and also on LinkedIn as I, I think I'm Andrew Weiner on LinkedIn. Yes, which is, which is how you and I got to know each other, and I have found LinkedIn to be a really great way to connect with people. And I would I would love to be connected with people through social media or through my website. All right, well that's good. That's noted. So now we know where to get in touch with you. One of the questions I wanted to ask you about is. How did your book and the characters evolve, and what led you to write Down by the River? As you mentioned in my um, biography, I'm a longtime bookseller. I've worked in publishing. Actually, since high school, I worked in the public library and then ended up working in bookstores and have worked for publishers for, for many years. And I, I love books, and I love children's books, and I also obviously love fishing and fly fishing. And some years ago, I had the thought that with the experience that I have, I hoped <laughs> that I'd be able to write a good children's book. And since fly fishing is the thing that I, I truly love the most as recreation, that that would be the theme of the story. A lot of people have asked if the family in, in the story is specifically my family. And honestly, it's not. <laughs> um, okay. It's a story that I thought would appeal to families in particular with a boy and his mother and his grandfather spending the day fly fishing together um, as a, a family activity that the grandfather and mother had shared when the mother was a child. And it's just a, a long-time family tradition. And I think that's the case for many fly fishing families, that it's something that connects generations and that there are places that people return to year after year and generation after generation that are really special to a family. I did fish as a kid with my family and particularly with my father. And we started when I was about six years old and continued to fish until just before he passed away in 2017. It was something that was a, a really special connection between him and me. And it's, it's great. I have so many pictures of the two of us together on trips sharing that 
and you know, it's something that will never fade away. And you know, also family pictures with my mother fishing and my sisters fishing. I think it's it's something that we all enjoyed very much. And just in terms of the origins of the story, when I first started writing it. I was part of a community online called the Northern California Fly Fishers Board, which was an interesting gathering of people who could be very curmudgeonly. We shared a love of fishing and quite often a general animosity towards each other because <laughs> of our different political feelings. And when I, I wrote my first couple of drafts, I shared it with the board, some people who were willing to take a look at it, and got some really great feedback um, in terms of some of the things that I'd written and things that could be improved. And you know, over the, the course of, honestly, almost 15 years, um, I continued to work on the book and showed it to various publishers through a couple of different literary agents, and it, it didn't get accepted for publication. And mm. working for a publisher, Abrams Books, I thought maybe I could show it to an editor at the company. Uh, the first one who did, wasn't sure that we could, um, as a company, publish a book by somebody who worked at the company. He found out that he could, but then he decided he didn't want to do it. But there was another agent, or another editor rather, who as a child and now as an adult fished with her family and the story appealed to her and she wanted to work with me on it. And over the course of about a year and a half, we worked together on the story and she had tremendous impact on it and really turned it into something that could be published. And I'm, I'm really, really grateful that she took the time to, to work with me and to make it what I hope is a really good book that, that people enjoy. Well, I will definitely attest that it is. It's a great, great book. And one of the things uh, I wanted to ask you, what type of work do you do at Abrams? I am a sales rep. Over my career, I've been both a sales rep and a manager for, for different publishers. And in my current position, I work with Western independent bookstores, um, some of the, the great, great bookstores in the world, like Tattered Cover and Powell's and Elliott Bay and Book Passage. But I also work with Amazon. They're my customer, which is you know a seven-hour conversation about what it's like to work with Amazon. Um, yes. I also work with <laughs> warehouse clubs like Costco and Sam's Clubs and BJ's back east. And it's, it's a really great job that gives me the opportunity to sort of experience all different types of retail. And Abrams is a really wonderful publisher to work for. It's been, it'll, actually, it'll be 18 years in May that I've worked for Abrams and couldn't be happier to work for such a good publisher. Well, I, I also think that the fact um, that they published your book is, you know, it says a lot about that because it is really a, a book that I would recommend to anyone with young kids. Thank you. And Thank you. particularly somebody who's outdoors oriented. And that brings me to my next question. In the interview I did with you that appears on my website, you noted the value of the places we fish is important for several reasons. You um, specifically said preservation is one of your primary concerns. How does introducing children to fly fishing and the outdoors go hand in hand with preservation of our resources? Yeah, I think it's it's a really vital question. Obviously, with what we face as a planet in terms of climate change and the the danger to resources, rivers, streams, oceans, the air, every every aspect of life on this planet. I think that children truly are our hope for change and progress to to do the things we need to do to preserve our planet. Um, I think somebody like Greta Thunberg is a great example of that. And uh, a 16-year-old girl who shows tremendous leadership on these issues. For me, my sense is that if you are experiencing the natural world, and in the case of fly fishing, by being in the incredibly beautiful places where we get to enjoy the sport, then you are going to be a steward of the resource. You're going to be an advocate for improving conditions. And with a new generation getting engaged, it, it gives me hope that, that we can make changes and that centuries from now we'll still have a planet that we can live on. One of the groups of, of people I've reached out to on LinkedIn is environmental educators. It's a, a huge force in this country, um, in schools and, and out of schools. And um, there's been a really
really great response to the book because there's an understanding that it does give the opportunity for engagement with uh, with kids to the outdoors. I was invited to write a piece by the Arizona Association of Environmental Educators about how I feel the book connects kids to the outdoors, and I'd be happy to, to share that with you as well. It really speaks to how important children are for the future of the planet, and something that I've experienced both on the water and also at, at fly shows is how many young kids are, are really involved in the sport and how talented they are both in the, the skill of casting flies and understanding how to fish and how to appreciate the resource. It, it's really heartwarming. I think that anyone, I think that teaching children in particular has a lot to do with doing with them, taking them out when they're really young and keeping them engaged, letting them understand what the world would be like without these particular resources. And so I definitely applaud you for doing that and for getting the word out about what we need to do to keep our environment. Here's a question I know my listeners will definitely want to know, will hear, is, and particularly those who fly fish, will understand and applaud when you answer this question. You mentioned to me that all of your vacations for the last 20 years have either been fully focused on fly fishing or have at least had a small opportunity to fish. Where are some of those places that you've gone fly fishing that, and, and the adventures, how exactly did they affect you? Being out here in California, most of my fly fishing over the last uh, 20 years or so have been in the western United States or western Canada. I've had the opportunity to fish up in Alaska, down in British Columbia, Washington, Oregon, California, Colorado, New Mexico, Montana. I would have to say that my, my favorite places to travel to are Montana and New Mexico for fly mm -hmm. fishing. And I think a lot of people are surprised that New Mexico is a fly fishing destination, but it has some of the most incredible water to, to access for fly fishing. And some of it is very small streams and in some cases somewhat isolated. And when you're in those places and you're surrounded by incredible nature and beautiful wildlife, it's a really extraordinary situation. For instance, in New Mexico, sort of northwest of Santa Fe, there's an area called the Valles Caldera, and it's a big volcanic uh, area that has several very small streams that can be five or six feet wide. And you drive out on bumpy dirt roads and hmm. fish in these tiny streams, and the, the fish are very shy, and you have to approach on your knees in many instances so they don't see you and swim off. <laughs> and I have seen coyotes and elk and deer and eagles and hawks while I'm out fishing. And it's just, it's the greatest feeling in the world. When my book was published, I did a little, uh, quite a bit of outreach to anglers, primarily on Instagram. And over the last two years since the book was published, I've met or have become acquainted with so many anglers around the world people in the United States and Canada and Finland and uh, Scandinavia and so many different places. And it's given me the opportunity to learn about new places. And I'm really looking forward to some future trips where I get to fish in person with some of these people who are extraordinary anglers and have so much knowledge of their, their local watersheds. I would say especially in Canada, both in places like Fernie and Calgary and over in Nova Scotia. It's, I just can't wait to, to get to some of these places. I'm going to try and take a trip to uh, the Fernie and Calgary area this, this fall. I was just going to ask, where is your next trip going to go? My, my next trip that yes. I have planned is actually Montana, Ooh. and it's the end of July. Yep. The, the organization Fly Fishers International, which is one of the, the major groups that supports fly fishing, both in terms of knowledge about the sport, but also conservation and education, uh, has an annual uh, gathering. Uh, this is the second year that it's in Bozeman, and it's running from July 24th through 20, no, that's not right, July 20th through 24th. And I'll be there signing books. 
their last year signing books and also have been at their shows in Boise and Albany, Oregon. Um, and it's just a, it's a pleasure to be there and, and meet lots of anglers. So I'll be there signing for a couple of days. And of course, we'll take advantage of the opportunity to fish in the Bozeman area, also go down to Yellowstone Park, fish the, the Yellowstone River in Paradise Valley near Livingston, just some of the most beautiful places to, to fish in the world. And, and just to, to tell you a funny story about doing signings, a lot of times I've been sitting in a, a booth signing my book and anglers will come and sit with me and they will just riddle me with questions <laughs> because they want me to prove to them that I'm not just a writer who's made up a story that I, I want to sell as a book. They want to make sure that I'm actually an angler, that I have experience, that I can you know, prove to them that I know what I'm talking about and I can talk about New Mexico or Montana and my fl- favorite places to fish and you know, I haven't failed yet, <laughs> but they, <laughs> they give me lots of tough, tough questions, and at the end, they, they buy a book, they shake my hand, they thank me, and uh, it feels pretty good. Well, I think we're definitely going to have to get you to send us a um, photograph of you fly fishing um, that we can use with the show notes so that people believe you do fly fish. Mm-hmm. I think I can do that. Okay. One of the um, things that I'm curious about is what advice do you give readers who want to get the most out of what I refer to as nature travel, Um, whether they're fly fishing or hiking or any other outdoor-oriented type of travel? What do you tell them? Like, what what is your advice? I think my, my advice would be to reach out to the community that already uh, engages in those activities for fly fishing. And I mentioned Fly Fishers International. There's also Trout Unlimited. And both of those organizations have clubs all over the country. And the members are extremely willing to share information to um, in- involve people who are new to the sport in, in the sport and to-, and to give some great guidance. For fly fishing, There, I think the greatest resource is fly shops, local fly shops. There is so much willingness on the part of fly shop staff to give good advice, give ideas for for destinations that can be a combination of, you know, purely angling or places where uh, a family can go if somebody is fishing and somebody would prefer to go bike riding or to go hiking. And And I think that's the same for hiking organizations and biking organizations. There's just so much information out there and a sense of community and uh, a sense of wanting to engage new people in the sport. You know, it goes back to what we were talking about uh, in terms of educating people about the importance of the resource and getting out into nature. That's always going to be the best way for somebody to understand how important that resource is. And these communities really want new people out there, new, new people who are going to be advocates and stewards for the resources. So I think those are probably the best ways to to find the, the best places to go. One of one of the first real fly fishing trips that I took was probably back in, must be about 1990 at this point. And I was married at the time, and my wife didn't fly fish, but I had been to Montana, I had been to Missoula on a previous trip, and returned. We actually went to a bookstore. And it was an interesting bookstore that had books, and it had food and beer. <laughs> and oh. the great place called oh, wow. Freddy's Feed and Read in Missoula, it sadly closed some time ago. And I was speaking to one of the, the folks who worked in the store. I said, we want to go out somewhere where we can fly fish and where my wife can bike. And he said, well, the lucky thing is that the best place to do both is right here um, outside uh, Missoula. It's a place called Rock Creek, and the fishing is phenomenal, and the mountain biking is phenomenal. And I think that's the case for a lot of destinations, that you can enjoy a lot of different activities in the same place. And I I still go back to to Rock Creek as often as I can. It's a a beautiful place. It is, definitely. Uh, That's one of the uh, ways that I've tried to get my own children outdoors is that I will sometimes, you know, tell them that, Let's uh, maybe I'll fish for an hour or so, and and you can walk around and and look, or you can ride a bike, or you know you can do something like that because that just gets them out there with me, watching me, and maybe I might even catch a, uh, a fish, which you know obviously makes it a lot more attractive to them. Again, you said that all of your vacations for the last twenty years 
have either been fully focused on fly fishing or at least portion of your vacation is dedicated to fishing. How have those adventures affected you? As I look forward to further fly fishing trips, I and as I have gotten to a certain age where retirement isn't too far in the distance, there are a lot of bucket list destinations that are, are on my agenda. Surprisingly, one of the places is Slovenia, which has become um, a destination for fly, fly anglers who travel over the last probably five years or so. A lot of people know that New Zealand is one of the great fly fishing destinations. It happens to be pretty expensive in a lot of instances to get there. Slovenia is known as kind of the, the New Zealand of Europe with incredible mountains and beautiful rivers, um, a particular type of trout called the marble trout that is particular to that area. So that's, that's somewhere I definitely would like to go. But yes, New Zealand at some point, and even Tasmania has great fly fishing. Argentina and Chile and different parts of Europe that we don't necessarily associate with fly fishing. And other places in the United States that I've I've not fished where it's been many, many years since I fished. I know that you're in Pennsylvania. Yes. And there is incredible fly fishing in Pennsylvania. Oh, I know. I live actually right by the Lackawanna River, which is where I do, you know, lately at least, at least 60% of the fly fishing I do is in that river. And um, it is an incredible river. And we've got the Delaware and we've got a bunch of other. um, So yes, you definitely need to come up to northeastern Pennsylvania. Sounds good. Many, many years ago, when I worked for Penguin Books, and I was a regional manager based actually in Manhattan, as I would travel out to work with the reps who I managed, I would always have fishing rods in the trunk of my car. And I was down in Pennsylvania working with one of my reps and had the chance to go over to Yellow Breaches Creek, which is one of the, the very, very famous streams in Pennsylvania, and just had a wonderful afternoon fishing out there. I'm going to allow my memory to say that I caught at least one fish, even though I'm not <laughs> sure that's true. Um, but I did. I have fished the Delaware as well. And yeah, I, I just, uh, so many different places to, to hit at, at some point over the next, hopefully, 25 to 30 years. Well, definitely let us know when you're going to be up in the area, and then maybe we can sit down and do another interview and talk to you about your fishing locally and, and what you think of it. That would be great. I would love that. All right. Well, I really appreciate you joining us, and um, I wish you the best, and um Have a wonderful year of fly fishing. Thank you. And I would just add, if people are looking to find the book, basically any bookstore in the country can get the book very easily if they don't have it in stock. It's, of course, available online through Amazon.com. We do love to support our our independent bookstores, though. And the same is true of fly shops. There are quite a few that carry it, but it's easy for them to buy copies as well for, for resale. And I think that our local independent fly shops are such a great resource. And anything that we can do to support them, we should absolutely do it. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, John. Please visit joanmatsuitravelwriter.com where you can subscribe to the show so you'll never miss an episode. While you're there, check out the travel writing courses, membership support platform, and private coaching services to help you learn travel writing. If you found value in this show, we would appreciate a rating on iTunes, and don't forget to tell a friend. This show is produced and edited at Keystone College by Ryan Evans. A full transcript of this podcast will be available on our website.